all of us, we need big events in our lives a lot of times to either jolt us out of our normal activity or place us on a different path to move us down the road spiritually. We're gonna look at one of those events in the lives of the disciples today, but I know that in my life, there's been some incredibly big events that have done this. I can think of about five to seven of them that have really and truly probably shaped me more than most of the other just kind of average days. The first day in my life that I know shaped me was the day that I was born. Uh, it was a pretty big day. Uh, before that day, I wasn't born. And then after that day, I was born. It was like dark and then, ah, light. And lots of people staring at me. That would have been the first day. The second day that changed my life was the day that I gave my life to Jesus, that I surrendered my heart to the Lord. I can remember it. I mean, like it was yesterday, it was a Tuesday night at church. I mean, you gotta be serious church people if you're there on a Tuesday night. I was on about the fourth row at this revival service. That was these old deals that you had to do where you had to go to church as a kid every night of the week instead of just like the normal ones. It was a Tuesday night, I was on the fourth row and I remember God calling me. Just this something in me going, Matt, you need to give your life to me. And I did that day. The third big event in my life uh, was in college. I remember the, the day my brother died in a car accident. And, and I know that in tragedy, most of us, we either run towards Jesus or we run away. Well, by the grace of God, he, he drew me even closer to him the day that my brother died. The fourth event, and I, and I wanna spend a minute talking about this one, was the day that Melissa and I got engaged. Uh, it was February 14th of the year 2000. The year 2000. Now, we had just survived Y2K. I mean, it was close, uh, but we had just done that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we filled our bathtubs up with water. Uh, we turned our computers off. We unplugged them. We took all of our money out of the bank and put it into gold. I was a college student. I didn't have any of that stuff. But, so it didn't really matter uh, to me if the world ended or not. I was going to wake up the next day. Well, fe that February, I remember Melissa and I, when we got engaged, it was, it was crazy. We'd been dating for over three years at this point. And about six months before that, Melissa had drawn the proverbial female line in the sand. You know what I'm talking about when I say that? She literally looked at me one day and said, Matt, where is this thing going? Uh, are we going to do this forever? Or is this just something that's on your deal? And I was like, whoa, 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 what are you, what are you talking about? She was drawing the line in the sand. And, and I looked at her that day. She said, are we gonna get married one day? And I looked at her and, and out of my infinite wisdom, uh, I said, well, Melissa, you have every quality of a girl that I'm looking to marry. Yeah, I thought that was a good answer. Uh, I really did. Evidently, it was not, uh, which caused a three-day hiatus in our relationship. Uh, our, our relationship went into the grave. But here's the good news. It resurrected on the third day. Um, and, and we got back together. Um, that, that's, that, I don't know. That was okay to say. We got back together um, after three days. And it was at that point I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life with this girl. I knew that I was, even though I gave the most foolish answer. Relationship advice dudes never say that. All right, come up with something better. So we got six months later down the road, Valentine's night, I'd promised her that we would never have a major moment on a holiday because it's so trite. Um, and so I remember we went to this nice dinner. I took her to this little cabin out in the woods, a friend of mine owned. And and I'd, I'd gone ahead of her that afternoon. I'd already got a fire ready. I'd put some dessert out there. I'd hid the ring where I wanted it to be. I had this little, this big bowl with a towel out. This was gonna be my night. I couldn't believe this was happening. And so we went to this cabin. We're sitting there, we're having some dessert. The fire is crackling in the background. It's like a lifetime Hallmark movie, all in one at this moment. We're sitting on this couch and I was like, it's time, it's time. I'm so nervous. I'm like, my palms are all sweaty and, and, and I'm like trying to be so smooth about it. And so we're having dessert and I put my little saucer on the table and I get down on my knee right in front of her and I reach up under the couch because I'd hit the ring up underneath the couch because I wanted to be smooth. And I pulled the ring out and I presented it to her. I said, Melissa, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you marry me? And she was like, yes. She said, yes. She was like, yes, 
I'll marry you. I would love to marry you. And what did I do? I took that ring out of the box because I wanted to know yes because I spent a lot on that ring. Before I took it out of the box, I put it on her finger. And at that moment, our commitment level went to, from something that was kind of wishy-washy to this incredible moment of promise where I put the ring of promise on her finger. I reached behind the couch. I pulled the bowl out and I was like, look, it's just a symbol of Christ's servanthood. I want to serve you the rest of my life. I washed her feet right there. It's just a symbol. I want to serve her for the rest of my life. And listen, we got married. I know it's a surprise, but we got married and this is our 20th wedding anniversary this year. This year, you should clap for that because that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And now listen, it's, it's a big deal for me, but it's an even bigger deal that that lady has spent that long with me. Uh, with me and she still loves me most days. We've never broken up since, but she's been mad at me a lot. Uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, she's been mad. But here's what I wanna say about that night. From that moment on, when Melissa accepted that ring on her finger, our commitment was made. We were looking towards our wedding. We were looking towards the day that we sealed the deal. From this point forward, that day changed us. We're going to look at an account with the disciples today that changed them. That not only changed the disciples in Mark 14, but it changed all of us even today. Today, we're going to dive into the story and the event of when the Passover feast became the Lord's Supper, became what we're about to share together. Because I can tell you this, this day was the day that changed everything for the disciples. Now look, I need to say this. I know we've kind of dove all around this story in the last weeks of this series, but don't let the familiarity of this story kind of breed contempt. Allow it to soak in. For some of you, you've been celebrating the Lord's Supper your whole life. You feel like you got a little hold on it, but don't go to Angry Birds, all right? No, I see your faces glow. I know it's not the app. Pay attention to the story and let's just let it dive in because you might be new to the faith and you may not even know what this is that we're about to do. But I want to show you what happened to make this significant. Let's get to the text because I only got like 75, 80 minutes left. Here it is. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. It says this. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when it was customary to go, customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover. Now, pause right there because you got to remember a couple things happening. Number one, we are in the last week of Jesus before the cross. We're in the week that Jesus is marching towards the cross of Christ. He's on his way there. We're on the Thursday morning right here in this account, and we're pointing towards the third Passover that these disciples were going to spend with Jesus. Now it's incredibly significant because these guys, they were all Jews. They had grown up celebrating this Passover meal together. But here's what I know about you and here's what I know about me. I'm not Jewish and I don't even know what that means half the time. So let me just kind of walk you through a couple of these terms that we've read because a couple of them are pretty interesting. We just read this idea of that they were in the middle of this thing called the festival of the unleavened bread. Now what does that even mean? It means this, God, when God delivered the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, when they were in slavery in Egypt, part of the remembrance of that event was that he denoted that for one solid week from the 7th to the 21st of this month called Nisan, not the car, it's the Jewish month, that, he, that they were to have no yeast or leaven in their home. And the reason he did that is because a lot of times in the Bible, this was looked at as an additive or something that was impure. And so for a week long, they would take all the yeast out of their bread and they would only eat these flat little tortillas as a remembrance that God did something, that he delivered them, that they didn't have time to let the bread rise. The second term that probably a lot of us aren't super familiar with is this idea of a Passover lamb. Or if you want to sound real smart around your friends, you can call it the Peshel lamb or the paschal lamb and here's what this is God in his infinite wisdom way back in Egypt told the Egyptians they needed to get a lamb for every house Exodus 12 you can read it later 
And they needed to bring that lamb into their home and they would have to actually slay that lamb and take part of the blood from that lamb and put it on the top of the doorpost and down the doorpost so that when the last plague, these plagues that God used to turn Pharaoh's heart, when the last plague came, their door covered was all blood, which represented the idea that they were cleansed with the sacrifice. Why? Because without the, there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. So from that point forward, they had to bring this lamb into the mix and they had to slay this lamb and have this time of this representation of what Christ was going to do one day. They had to do it every year. It's just a remembrance of what Christ did for them. The last thing we see on this is just the idea of the Passover. The Passover is, is just the celebration that God passed over the doors that were covered with blood and he let them live. And it's exactly what Christ does for us. When we give our life to Christ, he will pass over the judgment that we deserve and we will live in his power. So the disciples are walking up and they're going, hey, where do you want us to make this deal? Where do you want us to prepare this thing? Keep reading with me because what you need to understand was this celebration that they were about to have, you didn't mess with this celebration. It was something that represented this time they were in slavery for 450 years. And now for 1,450 years, if you were a Jewish family, you would celebrate this Passover meal together. You didn't mess with it unless you were the Lamb of God. Now keep going. Verse 13, it says this. So Jesus sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asked, where my guest room, where is my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. Now these two disciples walk up to Jesus. They say, where do you want us to do this? And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, here's what I want you to do. These two disciples, it, Mark doesn't tell us, but it, the two disciples that it's talking about is Peter and John. We see that in Luke's account of the gospel. And then they go into the city and Jesus says, watch for the guy that's carrying the jar of water, which if you're me, you're asking the question, well, how do I know which guy I'm looking for that's carrying the jar of water? To which it's an easy answer. It will be the only guy carrying a jar of water. Why? because guys did not carry the water in this time period. Did you know it was not a male's role? It wasn't what he was called to do. The ladies, like the lady at the well, right? The woman at the well, Samaritan woman, they were the ones that fetched the water. Nothing against them. It was just part of the roles, part of the system. And so when you walked into a town, if you would have seen a man carrying a big old jug of water, you would have known something was up at that moment. And then I asked the question, who is this mysterious, the owner of the house? Have you ever know? Have you, you do ask questions about the Bible. I ask myself these questions all the time when I'm reading, to which causes me to just go down wormholes all the time. So I was like, well, who is the owner? Here's a cool one for Bible trivia. The owner of the house is none other than the gospel writer, Mark. It's the gospel writer, Mark. How do we know that? Well, because Augustine and Oregon and Hierapolis, all of those church fathers agree that John Mark, this guy right here, was the owner of the house that's writing this account. And he allows them to use this upper room that becomes kind of the hub of ministry for all of, from this point, even into the book of Acts. Little known fact, you can visit Jerusalem today, which we're going to after Christmas this year, by the way. And you can go to where they really believe that this place is the upper room which became one of the first churches in all of Jerusalem. It was John Mark's house. Now, obviously, when you read this, when you're seeing a guy is carrying a random jug of water, the homeowner already knows that they're coming and has already been making preparations, you're seeing here something. And that's that Jesus had already made plans as to what was going to happen. Now, if you're not paying attention, you don't notice this. If you're just kind of reading and getting your verses out of the way. But when you look at this, you're gonna start seeing that obviously Jesus had already set all of this stuff up. He would have had to have already made these plans to which you say, well, why did he already make these plans? Well, it's kind of obvious. Number one, he knew that Judas was out to get him with the, with the religious leaders. So he couldn't tell Judas what was going on. 
Number two, he didn't want the religious leaders knowing what was going on. And Jesus knew in his sovereignty, in his plan, that he wanted to celebrate this meal with the disciples. He wanted to have this time where he poured his life into the disciples. So Jesus, in this clandestine plan, had already made all of these preparations. He's like, I tell you what, boys, go into the city. Look for the guy. Look for the guy. Follow the guy. The guy will take you up to this top room. It's like a Jason Bourne movie or something. I mean, Jesus has already done it, which leads me to this little little point, the disciples just had to follow Jesus's plan. Can I tell you that's all he asks us to do? What does Jesus do? He makes the plans for us. I mean, really, Ephesians 2.10, right? For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which what? Which God has prepared in advance for us. It's such a beautiful picture right here of how God prepares things for us. And all he's asked us to do is to step into his plans and walk in his plans. Did you know that when you were serving God, when you were following God, when you were walking after the heart of God, that you were walking in plans that he has made from you in the beginning of time. So how can you fail? You can't, you can't. It's what the disciples realize right here. Let's get back to the account, verse 16. The disciples left. They go into the city and check this out. And they found things. They found things just as Jesus had told them. Can I tell you that's a promise you can always trust? That things are always gonna be just as Jesus tells you they're gonna be. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12 and they were reclining at the table eating. And he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Now I want you to skip down to verse 22 because we spent the time talking about Judas a couple of weeks ago on this betrayal. Now go down to verse 22. It says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take it, eat Take it, this is my body. Now, if you're an underliner, that's your phrase right there. If you're a highlighter, this is your one for you because here's what I want you to know about this. There's so much in those little six words. Those six words, catch this, had never been said in all of eternity when it comes to talking about Jesus. Those six words, literally this one statement changed a 1,450 year old tradition. It would be like you walking into Christmas day, the kids coming downstairs on Christmas day and you just sitting there in your robe with a cup of coffee with nothing going on. No presents, no tree, no lights, nothing going on. And you going, surprise. That's what Jesus just did right here. Jesus had a game-changing statement. Why? Because this tradition, you didn't mess with this tradition. You didn't mess with this meal. This meal was so specific on how God had commanded all of the Jews to celebrate the deliverance that he had given him. In fact, this one, six words, take it, this is my body, was Jesus changing everything. So Matt, what, how, what are you talking about everything? Let me just nerd out just for a minute and tell you what's going on in this meal because we're not Jewish. We don't really realize it. Number one, the disciples would have gone that day, Peter and John, they would have gone into the city with their lamb. Did you know during this time period, you would have had to go get your lamb on Monday. This is the Thursday that we're talking about. The lamb would have had to live with your family or live with your group from Monday until Thursday in your home with you as the spotless lamb that you were going to offer as a sacrifice for your sins. What does that stand for? It stands for what Jesus did while he was with us on this earth. They would have got the lamb on Thursday. They would have taken it to the temple. They would have marched it to the temple to where the priest would have slain that lamb, taken some of the blood of the lamb and offered it onto the altar of God as a sacrifice for their sins. You would have had to do this every single year because it was a temporary sacrifice for your sins. And said, I mean, I mean, check this out. Josephus tells us, the historian, the Jewish historian tells us that somewhere around 250,000 lambs were slain on this one day every single year from three o'clock, when did Jesus die at three o'clock? You're gonna get it in a minute. All the way until six o'clock. 
They would have taken it to the priest. He would have slain the lamb. He would have hand, filleted the lamb, handed it back to them with no bones broken, no bones on Jesus broken. They would have brought it back to their house. They would have roasted the whole lamb, everything all at once, no broken bones. And then they would have started all the other preparations, which is a lot. During this meal that I told you, you can't change, the disciples would have had to get a bowl of salt water, God said. And he wanted it to be on the table because the salt water in this time for the Jews represented the tears that they shed in Egypt and God splitting the Red Sea. It would have been on the table for 1400 years. They would have also had to go get the unleavened bread and have it inside the Passover. Why? Because it stands for the fact that it is pure and they had to leave Egypt quickly under the deliverance of God. They would have also had to make and prepare the bitter herbs, the bitter herbs of, of chicory and, and maybe some mustard greens and just some, some of those nasty things that you eat at other people's house, but you don't eat them at your house. And they would have had the horseradish and, and they just reminded them of the bitterness conditions, of the harshness of the conditions. And they would have had to take in those herbs during part of this meeting and dip them in the salt water and somehow chew them down because it just represented the bitterness and the harshness Harshness. The disciples would have had to have made this brown paste. 1,400 years, every single one of these things happened. This brown paste they would have made called caraset. Now, the caraset looked like a jar of peanut butter, but it wasn't. It was made of apples and dates and pomegranates all mixed together. And it looked like a brown peanut buttery paste that represented the bricks they made in Egypt under incredible toil for the Pharaoh. Inside that caraset, there would have been a cinnamon stick that stood for the straw that they would have put inside of all of this. All of this was preparations. Peter and John are making these preparations. And then they would have had to go and get the wine. Now, during the meals, they would have sang a psalm, said a prayer, had a little bite. Sang a song, had a prayer, had a little bite. This was like a five hour meal. I mean, this wasn't like pulling through the Dairy Queen over here this afternoon and getting on home. This was a long, long meal that was exactly the same every single year. They would have had these cups of wine they passed and it was called the cup of promise. The first cup of promise brought to mind the idea that, that from Exodus chapter six, that God was releasing them from the burdens of Egypt. The second cup they would have passed was this bondage cup that God was releasing them from bondage. And then finally at about hour three and a half of the meal, they would have got to the third cup of wine. Now remember when the disciples drank these cups, it was almost like Melissa putting the wedding ring on. It was like them knowing the promise and feeling the promise. The third cup, listen to this, it was the redemption cup. It was the redemption cup that represented that God with his outstretched arms was redeeming Israel out of Egypt. Now, look, when we read this story, it's like three verses. And we read over it like it's this fast food, like this quick meal. But no, no, no. This was a meal that was a worshipful moment in God. And at this moment, the cup of redemption is when God took the body and when God took the blood and when Jesus said, hey boys, listen to this, Mark 14, 22. This is my body. It had never been said before. Never been brought up before. And Jesus took the focus of this meal, this Passover meal, right? Took the focus off solely looking at what God did in the past to solely what he's gonna do in the present and the future. That's the difference. That's the difference of what happened. So at the third cup, the third cup of promise is no longer about a redemption from Egypt. It is no longer about a yearly sacrificial roasted lamb and blood on a doorpost. The third cup, the cup that we're about to celebrate in just a few minutes is now about the eternal sacrifice of not a little lamb, but the lamb of God. That's what's happening. That's what Jesus is doing right here. Because he's what? He is the spotless lamb. 
that came to take away the sins of the world. First Peter 1, verse 19, it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Listen to what Hebrews 10, 12, it says, but our high priest, that's Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins. Good for all time. Then he sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. You know what's happening right here? He's changing everything. He's changing everything. Jesus knew that he was about to be betrayed. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew that he was gonna rise from the grave, but Jesus could have called it all off at this very moment. He's like, no, 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 no. I am the lamb takes away the sins of the world. And I will die for you a substitutionary death. Now that's a big theological $5 word that literally just means this, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, died the death that I deserved because of my sin. And because of that, now I can live the life that he offers me. That's what it means. He said, this is my body. Keep going, verse 14 or chapter 14, verse 22, it says this. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. He took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all, and they all check it out, they all drank from it. What does that mean? They were all receiving the promise. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them, truly I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Do you realize what just happened in front of these disciples? Look, we, we gloss over it because we've been reading this our whole lives. The old covenant of work, the old covenant of offering sacrifices, the old covenant of try harder, try harder, try harder was right now changed. And now it is the covenant of Christ's blood covering you and covering me and giving us life. It is no longer a covenant of works. It is now a covenant of Christ's love for me. Why? Because he is the lamb. He's the lamb. This is a game changer. It's the new covenant. Now look, I can't do justice in like a 50, 70 minute sermon on this. I really, I just can't. But here's what I wanna do. I wanna give you five truths that the Lord's Supper teaches. I wanna give you five truths that it teaches that can help us as we walk into this moment, realize what is it for me that Christ is trying to do in me. Number one is this. It teaches us that remembrance can shape our current trajectory. The Lord's Supper teaches us that when we remember what Christ has done for us in the past, right? The deliverance he's given me, how he has covered me, how his body has been broken, how his blood has been shed. When I begin to really and truly remember what God has done for me, it reshapes where my future is gonna be. Here's what I know about a lot of us. A lot of us have been walking with Jesus so long that we forget what we have been saved from. We forget that's what the Passover meal was about. It was about a remembrance moment for these people to know what exactly did God do for them. The Lord's Supper for us is a remembrance moment of what Jesus did for us. In fact, Luke 22, verse seven is, look what it says. It says, and Jesus, this is Luke's account, took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. What did he say? Do this in remembrance of me. You remember that, right? It was on that old school table, right? You remember it your whole life? You're like, why did they scribe that on there? That's why. Because when we take the Lord's Supper and when we truly remember that Christ delivered me out of death, our remembrance shapes our future. Why? He's taken my place. He is my substitute. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, 
God has removed my transgressions. Colossians 1.13, for, for God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. The Lord's Supper, when we look back, changes our trajectory. But number two, proclaiming Jesus' death, the Lord's Supper teaches us, gives us hope proclaiming Jesus' death. It gives me hope. And this seems so counterintuitive, right? We don't celebrate death. I mean, that's weird. The day of the dead is a weird deal in a lot of countries, right? We don't celebrate that. Death is a sting to us, but we can celebrate Jesus' death. Why? A couple reasons. Number one, he didn't stay that way. He said it was was just a temporary moment for him. Number two, it released him to ascend back to the Father. Now he's at his rightful seat and he is... He is what? He is on my behalf speaking to the Father. Number three, it was the only way that my sin could be satisfied so I can celebrate the death of Jesus. And it was for me. It was for me. You see, it does this. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to become sin on my behalf so that what? So that I may become the righteousness of God. You see, we can celebrate Jesus' death. Why? Because he died it for us. He died for me and you. And when we see this, this isn't a big deal for us. But if you were a disciple, it was a big deal. This was a big moment. Why? Because now the cross of Calvary, catch this, is about to replace that moment coming out of Egypt as God's biggest redemption act of all time. Now we celebrate it. Number three, number three, Lord's Supper teaches us that self-examination pushes us to walk with Jesus. It pushes us to walk with Jesus. Man, what do you mean by that? It means this, we're really good at faking our walk with Jesus, especially to ourselves. I'm really, really good at, at, at faking myself out of how I'm doing. And you're really good at faking me out of how you're doing. How do I know that? Because it's not until the moment you crash and burn that most of us reach out for help. But what is Jesus doing right here? What's the Lord's Supper doing? The Lord's Supper is having a spiritual checkup in our our lives. In fact, you can see it. We skipped the verse just a minute ago, but you'll see what he's doing with the disciples, right? Verse 18, while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you is gonna betray me, the one who is eating with me. And they were saddened And one by one, they said to him, do you mean me? What is Jesus doing? Jesus is forcing them into this moment of self-reflection. You see, when we take the body and we take the blood of Christ, the symbol behind this is forcing me to look into my life and see where is it that I'm walking. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians like this. He says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Listen to this, verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and before they drink the cup. You see, the Lord's Supper is a moment of spiritual check-in that forces me to look back and say, look, am I just stepping all over the blood of Christ? Am I just stepping onto the body of Christ? And is it, or is it changing me? Here's number four. The Lord's Supper shows us that anticipating eternity shapes our earthly decisions. It shapes our earthly decisions. Matt, where, where, do you, where do you see that? Well, I want you to look right here because we said it a few times that Jesus in this meal is looking back at the past, right? The deliverance of Israel out of bondage. He's looking at this current moment. He's looking at these guys going, this is my body, this is my blood. This, I'm about to die for you. I'm about to become the lamb. And then Jesus is also looking at the disciples going one day In the future, catch this, verse 14, verse 25, it says, truly I tell you, Jesus said, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What did Jesus do at this very moment? I love this. Jesus points towards the future and he says, listen, when my kingdom comes, when I come back to this earth, when I receive all of those who are my children back with me, we will celebrate this meal together. And he he almost looks at the boys and goes, hey, so act like it. So act like it. 
I love the symbolism because why? Because Jesus says when our decisions are made in light of eternity, it would make things so much clearer for us. The things that we chase after would be so much different. The things that we care about would be so much different if one thing that we're looking for is eternity. Do you know there's gonna be a day? Revelation chapter 19 where we celebrate the Passover with Jesus again, where we celebrate the Lord's Supper with Jesus again. And it's called the marriage supper of the lamb, of the lamb. Now go with me just for a minute. Remember when Melissa put the ring on? It changed us. It changed our commitment level. Why? Because at that moment, we started looking towards our wedding day. Started looking towards that day. Do you know if you were Jewish, engagement looked a little bit different for you. Let me just walk you through it. If I was a dude and I wanted to marry Melissa, I would have had to go to her house with my father. We would have negotiated what is called a bride price. Do you know this, girls? You guys are worth something. And we would have negotiated how much you're worth. That's a little bit weird, but it's a dowry in some countries. Once that price was negotiated, my father would have broke out the amount of money that was negotiated for. He would have handed that money over to the other family. And as the groom-to-be, I would have poured a cup of wine. Now catch this. It's all gonna tie together in just a minute. I would have poured a cup of wine and I would have handed it to Melissa. And if Melissa would have drank that wine, it would have sealed the deal at that moment. Why? Because it was the cup of promise. It was the cup of promise in a formal setting. It would have meant the deal was sealed. At that very moment, she would have drank the wine. I would have got back on my camel with my papa and I would have gone back to my house I would have built onto the family's house a home for Melissa and I to live in, a quarters for us to live in. It probably would have taken a year, in some cases two during this time, but my bride was still living at home and we didn't even see each other. And catch this, once I finished my quarters for her to live in, once I had, catch this, prepared a place for her, I would have got my friends together. I would have walked myself all the way back to her house in the middle of night at some point, And I would have blown a big horn in the middle of the night. And I would have called out for my bride to come out of that home and to go back, catch this, to the place that I'd prepared a place for her. And then we would have had our wedding celebration and the marriage feast. Are you making these connections? What did Jesus do right here? Jesus gave them the cup of promise. He looked at him and he said, literally, I am the lamb. And one, I'm going to my father's house. I'm preparing a place for you. And one day I am coming back to get you and I'm taking you to be where I am, to where you will be for eternity, to the marriage supper of the lamb. And when was it sealed? At the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption. This is incredible. Jesus is tying these moments together and showing us that we have to live with eternity in the mind and not these temporary things that are just gonna go away. The cup of redemption. It's the third cup. It's the one he held up. And here's number five thing the Lord's Supper teaches us. It teaches us that worship is always a response of meeting with Jesus. It's always a response. Can I, can I just be really honest with you? If you're having trouble worshiping, it means you're having trouble being with Jesus. If you're having trouble in your personal worship, that means you're having trouble in your personal walk with Jesus. The disciples, their, their minds were absolutely blown when Jesus changed this thing up. Look at what happened to him. Mark 14, verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, Right there where it says, when it it says sung a hymn, I want you to write Psalms 118 above that in your Bibles. Or or you can highlight and put a note in. Because that's what they would have sang. Remember earlier I said this was a very specific meal. Psalms 113 through 118 are called the Psalms of the Passover. Every single one of those Psalms would have been sang at the Passover. Psalms 118 is the Hallel. 
It's, it's this moment they would have sang at the ending of the Passover feast. And I spent some time summarizing it this week and I just wanna read it over us because I want you to see the response of what happens when the Lamb of God gets control of your life and you receive the cup of promise and you look towards eternity. Check this out. I just wanna read it to you. I spent some time summarizing it. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. He brought me out. He set me apart. What can man do to me? God is my defense. He is my strength. He is my salvation. His hand has lifted for me. And he, God, has done mighty things. And I will enter his gates with praise. For he, Psalms 118, for he is the stone the builders rejected. But he has become my cornerstone. Who's it pointing to? It's pointing to Jesus. The lamb is in the room with the other lamb and is the cornerstone. All of this is happening at this moment. Catch this out. Blessed is anyone who comes in his name. God, I will join the eternal praise. I will lift you up. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. That's the Lord's Supper. That's when all of this, the new covenant, the eternal promise, the cup of redemption. That's what we're about to celebrate. This is the cup of redemption. It's the broken body of Christ given for you, given for me.